All right, so I'm going to do the quick review of the last two classes. Okay, do you think I can do a super rapid review? I'm going to have you help me. Anybody remember, is there any remembrance of Proverbs chapter 8? Raise your hand. Any remembrance of Proverbs chapter 8? All right, so in Proverbs chapter 8, Jesus says, Beside my father, I was a master craftsman. Yeah. And And daily, I was my father's delight. So the father's delight was so beaming on Jesus that he couldn't contain contain his delight. So then it says, and so I I, (laughs) I rejoiced ever before him. So we have heaven's workshop in the process of creation looking more like a party than it does a job site. Right? Is this, is, this, is this ringing a bell? And so there's so much mutual bliss and enjoyment happening between father and son. Uh, this is the best party you could possibly imagine. There's so much reciprocal delight and joy happening there that it literally produces light. Like the warmth and the, the way the sun produces heat and light, this is what the Bible describes as glory. The mutual bliss between father and son is so amazing, it produces light. It generates energy. That's why Israel said, lift up the light of your countenance upon me, God. The happy face of God, let your face shine upon me. Because once you've experienced the shining face of God, the delight and joy of your father, you can't stand to live without that face anymore. So then what does Jesus do? We're still in Proverbs 8. He's so full of the Father's delight, he's dancing and rejoicing. And then he says, but my delight, my delight is focused on who? The sons of men, which is another way of saying people. Right, you and me. So even before the human race was created, And the purpose of the creation of the human race was to design a class of beings because elephants and giraffes and insects can't fully appreciate the joy of heaven, can they? So so the Godhead set out to design a class of beings that, that, that could come in on heaven's party and feel as much joy as the father and son have been experiencing for eternity. They wanted to create someone to enjoy. And so Jesus says, my delight. My father father focuses his delight on me, but the focus of my delight is people. So if people are created as the object of God's joy, I'm telling you that he didn't change his mind when man fell. He had a remedy for sin before sin happened. And the first thing that he was doing when Adam was full of shame, fear, and guilt is devising a coat to cover Adam with, which will be the remedy to restore relationship. Do you see the big pompa heart there? He's just amazing. But Jesus, you are the focal point of the Lord's joy. And so when he redeemed you, last week we talked about Luke 15. Does that sound familiar? Luke 15, there's three stories in Luke 15. Help me. Okay, the lost, the, the, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. I, count, I had you circle Uh, uh, things that had to do with rejoicing or dancing or making merry. How many many approximately references in Luke 15 did you get? She got 11. Is that close to what what did you guys get? Just call them out. 10? 10, 11, yeah. So it's somewhere in there. But if rejoicing is the theme of Luke 15, 
What God is trying to tell us in the story of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son is that I can't wait to rejoice when I restore relationship with lost people. Yeah. It's almost like God's desire to rejoice when he restores restores relationship with us overrides our focus on our own sin and failure. Because the father ran towards the son and embraced him before the son got a chance to to confess his sin or have it, or even say his repentance speech that he rehearsed. So the love of God for humans is almost superseding humans' uh, sense of their own failure. And this son gets tackled in the father's embrace and invited back into heaven's party. The party in the prodigal son's story is is an earthly example of the party that was in heaven in Proverbs 8. Are, are you with me? And so the picture in Luke 15 is that when God restores relationship with, the, with lost sons that he enjoys, then it's time to rejoice. And now, even though we failed, we still get full access to heaven's party. And we still get the full restoration of the identity and privilege and dignity of sonship that we thought we lost. Isn't that amazing? So that is my summing up of the last two weeks. And this week, we're going to focus on Psalm 139. And um, can you, Sandy, can you pass out? Um, I have chosen to have you look at Psalm 139 in a version called the Passion Version. So I know, I just want us to all be looking at the same version here. So this is coming out for you. And the format of tonight is going to be somewhat different. So in Psalm 139, we have another chapter where God is expressing his delight for you. But how many know, can I have you raise your hand if you know that you're not just a number in the redeemed army? You're not just some type of generic person in the horde of redeemed humanity that God doesn't know, that you are specific as an individual, that you are designed by God and crafted by the master craftsman. Your unique set of gifts and temperament and your makeup and even your physical body is a masterpiece work of God, as if Scripture says that every single human is like God's Mona is like is Leonardo da Vinci the one that did Mona Lisa? Okay, that was his that was his masterpiece, right? So Scripture says each one of you in your uniqueness and as a craft as God's craftsmanship in His artistry is like you're all like His Mona Lisa. The scripture for that is you are his workmanship created for good works in Christ. Workmanship means masterpiece. So in Psalm 139, we're actually taking this truth of God's enjoyment of us and we're making it more personal. You do know, you've learned that that God created you as a human race because he enjoys you. He redeemed you because he enjoys you, but this is taking it more personal. This is, this is God's every thought towards you continually is love. And in your uniqueness, in, in your specialness, he doesn't treat you like a generic redeemed human. Okay, so are you, are you with me? I'm wanting to take this truth and make it more personal. And the, we're going to do something different tonight. We're gonna, we are going to... We're going to listen to some people that have personalized God's statement of their own identity so that we can do that in this class. Because in a class like this, I'm giving you some revelation, which is really good, but this is more like I'm giving you the menu, but you have to learn to feed on this yourself. So it does no good just to keep looking at the menu, which is the equivalent to listening to to, um, teachings. But, but when you begin to feed on these truths for yourself, then they become part of you. And so I wanted to give you some examples of two people besides me tonight that have taken the truth 
of, of uh, their identity in God. And, and one of them is Neil Frazier. Can you just stand for a second, Neil? Yeah. <laughs> well, I will introduce Neil at more length when he comes up to talk. And the other one is Mike Hubbard. Can you stand, Mike? So I wanted you to see real human examples of people who have had an encounter with the truth of, the, of God's uh, uh, way of looking at them and they have done something to personalize it so it actually becomes part of them, right? So is, is, it, good? is it good that we do this? Yeah. It is. Because I need more grace from God to actually live a truth than to believe a truth. And, and it, is, it is not adequate to just believe a truth until you're living it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I just think that as we showcase some people tonight that have discovered some unique methods for how to live a truth, that you will catch hold of some ideas for how you can do it too. Isn't this good? I am maybe a little bit more adept. Think about a science course in high school or college. Anyone ever t taken a science class? Okay. You had the lecture portion, right? And then you had the lab portion. And like, I feel sort of like, I feel like God's love professor, <laughs> okay? I, I like the lecture side of it, okay? And then I realize that there are some people that, that are really majored in the lab course of personalizing the love of God and their identity, and God wants to showcase those too, those people too. So are you having fun? Okay, because that was, that was my prayer for this class. My main prayer was, God, I wanna have fun, and I want them to have fun. And that makes sense because the entire subject is, that, is, is about joy. So we can't be sourpuss Christians after this class. It's not, it's, it's illegal, okay? And we can't be sourpuss Christians in our style of telling other people about the love of God. We can't do that. It's illegal. I declare it illegal. <laughs> okay. So as you've gotten your uh, Psalm 139, um, this passion version, I want you, I hope you've got a pen or pencil with you because what I want you to do is take about the next 10 or 15 minutes and I want you to circle words or phrases in, in this chapter that stand out to you. I want you to think about this. What is God saying? What, what does God think and feel about you personally? What does God think and feel about you? And so anything, words or phrase that stand out, because we're going to have a discussion. So right now I'm going to stop talking. And uh, it, look, it says 707 up there. And so in approximately 10 or 15 minutes, we're just going to stop. And then I want to in, engage you in a dialogue of what, of what you found in there. This stuff is t almost too good to be true. Uh, can, can I just start off and say something about the Psalms? I want you to know theologically that the Psalms are every bit as much of the canon of Scripture. There are 66 books in Scripture. They are all divinely inspired, okay? So the artistic, the poetic books of Scripture are equally divinely inspired. That means every word is inspired by God. Okay, good. is this good theology, theologians out there? So there's a tendency sometimes when we read the Psalms to think this is flowery poetic language and they're, they're taking too much poetic license here. This is just fluffy poet, poet people language. I'm telling you, this is, this is as rock solid theologically as the book of Romans. So, so it has as much weight theologically to, to, to determine what God thinks about you as the book of Romans or the book of John. So does this bring an expanded definition to John 3.16, for God so loved the world? So I'm giving you the right to bask in these kind of truths 
and telling you that this is theologically sound. You can feed on this stuff. You, you have the right to define who you are by this stuff. And if you don't feed on what God is saying about you, then you will end up thinking less of yourself or agreeing with some type of spirit of accusation or shame. So you actually, that's why Jesus says in Scripture, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And the term is make free, not set free. Okay, so, so why is that important? Because you can set a bird free that's caged up, but God is doing more than setting you free. He's making you free. That means that the hands of the artist are crafting you into a vessel that is completely free. Yeah, isn't that good about Scripture? Yeah, I got to give, give you some time to share. I get myself, I get myself inspired by my own teaching. <laughs> by line and I want you to raise your hand if you've got something circled that you want to share because this is a dialogue now so I'm going to start off in the beginning Lord you know everything there is to know about me you know you know what what, what question arises to me in this very first sentence you know everything there is about me and 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 what I th- want to respond to that is and you still like me <laughs> you know that scripture that says, J- David says, you're the apple of my eye, or I'm the apple of your eye, he says. That, that means that I am the focal point of God's pleasure. That means he's gazing at me, and he likes to focus on me. And when he focuses on me, I'm the object of his delight. Anyone else on the, yeah. You're seeing the sparkle in his eyes, which is his delight for you. So when you're seeing his delight for you in his eyes, what do you think that does to your spirit? It melts it, but it does more than that. It, it fuels it. The joy of the Lord is a source of your strength. I, I, I'm, I'm also, when it says you've examined me, and there's more than one place that says this, I, um, I'm grateful that I get, uh, that he, I get an exam from God and somehow pass. So this examination is not something painful that ends up in me feeling disqualified. This is, this is an exam where, where he touches my heart with the gaze of his love. That's a different kind of exam. You know, when you hold your baby, there's a certain focal distance that, that where you, you know, you're sort of arm length or a little bit closer and as the baby looks into their parents' eyes, they're actually looking to see if their parents enjoy them. They can, they can perceive that language before they've learned any language. They look into the eyes of their parents, and if they see joy in the eyes of their parents, then this causes their emotions to form in a healthy way. If, 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 if people are missing this in the formative years of infancy, then they will be depleted in their emotions for the rest of their life, even into adulthood. And so God wants to retroactively give every broken-hearted toddler and every broken-hearted infant, he wants to retroactively give you the experience of being enjoyed by your father and looking into the face of your father and not feeling rejection, but seeing joy pouring out of his eyes towards you. And he has the ability to retroactively heal brokenhearted people. He can go back into your childhood because he exists outside the realm of time. And he can heal you at the place where your heart was broken. And I'm not just speaking theory. Because in the last two years, this has happened to me time and time again. So I have become a more credible witness of this truth because God is doing it on me on the inside. And he's had to encounter me into some, there's, there's some places in my childhood, even when I was age three and when I was age eight. And, and, and I have seen the Lord, I have actually seen and encountered the Lord do something to me. And, in, and I've encountered the Lord in a new way in the place where, in, at the timing that my heart was broken. Isn't that powerful? So then his scripture says, 
You perceive every moment of my heart and soul, and you understand my every thought, my every thought before it even enters my mind. Yeah. Uh -huh. Good. And that scripture says, I think that's Hebrews. He was tempted on all points like as we are, yet without sin. And it says we have a high priest that can, that can have compassion on our weaknesses because he's walked through the same things. He's not a God who's aloof and distant. He's a God that actually became a human and understands human emotions. So she highlighted the word understand, good. Can I say something about emotions for a second? Um, your emotions are valid whether or not they're based on an accurate perspective. Can I say that? That means that your Father in heaven cares about your grief and, and he cares about your sorrow and he cares about the feeling of rejection. And some of those things might be based on a, a not, not a fully accurate perspective, right? I mean, someone that is ultra sensitive can feel rejected even if that's not reality, right? So, so does your Father in heaven still care? Yes. So, so your emotions are valid, even if they're not based on an accurate perspective. And then the Lord will, will let you know that he cares. But here's a cliche that you've heard. People don't know, they don't care what you know until they know that you care. So God, when, when, when he is encountering brokenhearted people, he lets them know that he cares before he tells them what he knows. Are, are you with me? And then when he tells you what he knows, then he can adjust your perspective so that it's more accurate. You know, because he doesn't want a bunch of oversensitive, self-indulgent Christians that are just emo emotional basket cases, right? But, but he also doesn't reject people that are, are struggling in their emotions. And so I'm telling you that your emotions are valid even if they're based on a faulty perspective because God cares. And that's why David was called a man after God's own heart because he was so transparent with God. You see every range of emotion being expressed to God in the Psalms. His grief, his offense, his, his he, you know, he's, every possible thing is expressed to God in the Psalms. And David was a man after God's own heart because he was not trying to hide anything from God. So I'm telling you, you have the right to pour out your heart to God. He cares about how you feel. And he has the divine right to adjust how you feel and, and to correct your theology sometimes. Are, are, are you with me? Yeah. Okay, so you are intimately aware of me, Lord. You read my heart like an open book. Anyone aware? She circled the word aware. And you know all the words I'm about to speak before I can even start a sentence. You know every step I take before my journey even begins. Yeah, I, think it, I think this goes along with a, you will never leave me or forsake you, forsake me, because, because he's with you every step. Yeah, the, do you know that intimacy is based on being known? Can, intimacy, we, we, have somehow, we have somehow misinterpreted intimacy as being sex. Intimacy, it, the core of intimacy is being known. So, so intimacy in a marriage, sexually, is based on intimacy of two spouses knowing one another. Two hearts that, that have nothing hidden, where everything is transparent and fully disclosed. That, that intimacy is, is, that's what intimacy is. It's, and she just described that sometimes this is not easy for her to do with a person. So she, you just mentioned, you read my heart like an open book that God is a God who knows and cares. Uh, so let's keep going. You've gone into my future to prepare the way, and in kindness you follow behind me. Um, this reminds me of the scripture in Psalm 23 that says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. And over here, your kindness will follow behind me. You know, when, when I'm thinking about God's kindness, goodness, and mercy following me, I feel like Christians are the opposite of Pigpen in the Peanuts cartoon, where, where he draws behind him the cloud of dust everywhere. 
you know what I mean? So we are the opposite of that. Is good, goodness and mercy and kindness follows behind us like a plume of God's favor. <laughs> Isn't that a good image? But I have to spare me. You, I bet there's a bunch of people that said to spare me from the, from the harm of my past. Yeah, yeah. Um, see, see, because his forgiveness is so thorough that he erases your sin and now then doesn't hold it against you. There are at least four scriptures that talk about the, the thoroughness of God's forgiveness. Will you allow me to just blurt them out right now? Boom. Psalm 51 says, you blot out my sin. So there's heavenly whiteout somehow. He blots it out. Then there's another scripture that says, as far as the east is from the west, so far your sin is removed from me. There's another scripture that says, you bury my sin in the sea of forgetfulness. So if your sin was like 10 miles under the ocean, no one would ever see it. Jeremiah 31 says, you will remember my sin no more. And so I, I tell you to, to meditate on the thoroughness of God's forgiveness is a good thing to think about. Not only does he forgive you so thoroughly that he forgets it, that he erases it from your record, but he also doesn't treat you any differently after you've sinned and confessed it. And there's not many of us that have been deeply, deeply hurt by a person whose forgiveness for that person is so thorough that we actually don't treat them any differently at all than before we got hurt. And I'm telling you, that's how thorough his forgiveness is. And so, wow, thank you, God, for sparing us from the harm of our past. Last week, we even talked about how God edits our biography. We talked about Abraham, who was one of the most fearful men of his time, but he was chosen by God to become the father of faith. And God edited his biography and in the New Testament refers to Abraham in a completely different way than I read about him in the Old Testament. He lied about his wife twice. He conspired with Ishmael um, to, or Hagar to have Ishmael and then he laughs the laugh of unbelief when the angel comes to him and promises the son. And in the New Testament, I just have to review this. It's my favorite. In the New Testament, this is how Abraham's defined. He was fully persuaded that what God promised he was able to perform. And he wavered not in faith, giving the glory to God. And God accounted it to him as righteousness. That is a God who has so, who has so given mercy to a weak human that he's now redefined by a, by a whole different identity. And I told you that God does not define you by your shortcomings and your sins he doesn't define, he, he knows about them. He cares about them. He doesn't sweep them under the carpet. You know, he, he requires us to deal with sin, but he doesn't define you by your sin and shortcomings or we're all toast. <laughs> so, and look at this. The, you have to have circled this next one. You, with your hand of love upon my life, you imparted a father's blessing to me. Now raise your hand if you got that one there. Yeah, that one should be it. Yeah, Barry's got two hands up. You imparted a father's blessing to me. Now, let me just highlight somebody over here. Um, Alan James, raise your hand. Okay, Alan, Alan, tell us how old you are. He's 82. There is nobody that I know in the kingdom that is able to impart a father's blessing with a deep voice. <laughs> He's, he's got the voice. He actually used to be in radio. And he has this deep, wonderful voice. And when he speaks over us and imparts a blessing, it's just, it's just epic. So, so he's going to be doing that, um, you know, off and on in this class. So I'm going to have to speed it up a little bit because um, this stuff is too good, but I've got some other things planned. So this is just too wonderful, deep and incomprehensible. Your understanding of me brings wonder and strength. Where could I go from your spirit and where um, could I run from your face? If I go up to heaven, you're there. I'm going to keep going. Um, if you have it circled, we're just going to have to hold it. If I go down to the realm of the dead, you're there. If I fly with the wings of the shining dawn, you're there. If I fly into the radiant sunset, you're waiting. Wherever I go, your hand will guide me. 
Anyone, anyone circled that? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Do you feel like God's guidance is your, in your life is comforting? There are times where I feel confused and I want to be in the center of God's will and I don't know if I am. And this is a good thing to meditate on. Your strength will empower me. But what is the source of your strength? <laughs> thank you. Nehemiah 8.10 the joy of the Lord is your strength. His strength will empower me. It's impossible to disappear or ask for the darkness to hide me, for your presence is everywhere, bringing light into my night. I bet you somebody circled that, bringing light into my night. There's no such thing as darkness with you. The night to you is as bright as the day. I'm going to... This is, this is the, the phrases that talk about what God was thinking and feeling about you when you were in the womb. Now, my daughter is currently pregnant, and, and she has a baby that's about the size of a pea in her womb. At the moment of your conception, there's something that was really radical that happened. We know that biologically, there was something going on when, you're, when your father and mother conceived you. So, we're, we're, we're stipulating that there's a biological aspect to your conception, okay? So, but, but in addition to that, God, there's a miraculous thing where, where God is crafting you at the moment of your conception into a work of art, a masterpiece. He's weaving not just your body, but he's weaving the gift mix of your soul and your temperament together and and so it's, it's, it's a craftsmanship that is amazing so that you are this work of art, this masterpiece in his hands. So let's, let's read those verses. You, you, you formed my innermost being. You shaped my delicate inside and my intricate outside. You wove them together in my mother's womb. I thank God for making me so mysteriously complex. Everything you do is marvelously breath, breathtaking. It amazes me to think about it, how thoroughly you know me, Lord. You shaped every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place. You were carefully, skillfully shaping me from nothing into something. Now, I had to circle that, from nothing. You know, so this isn't just talking about you in the womb as a fetus. I believe that when we're born again, God takes humans that are nothing and shapes them into somethings. He, he takes, he is attracted to humans that think they are zeros and turns them into heroes. And so, so this, I just love this phrase. You were, you, and this, this is not just in the womb, but this is your entire life. He's carefully shaping you from nothing into something. And the something that he's shaping you into is an infinite work of art in the Father's hand. You are his craftsmanship, his workmanship, created for good works. You saw, you saw who you created me to be before I became me. So that's got to be a statement for the identity class, okay? You saw who I was before I knew who I was. So, so who does that give the right to define who you are? He knows your true identity before you do. You saw me. You saw who you, who you created me to be before I became me. Now, do, you, is, do you like this version? Except for maybe Jamie. Do you like this? You, <laughs> okay, so there's, there's more in here that is so rich. I mean, we could take, we could take another 45 minutes. I just want to highlight something here. Um, ne I don't know if this is the next page for you, but, and I don't have verses, but do, can you find the statement that's, that begins with this? Every single moment you're thinking of me. Can you find that? Okay, verse 17. Let's highlight that phrase for a second. Every single moment you are thinking of me. Now, the next line says, how precious and wonderful to consider that, now here, here is, is the crowning statement of the whole psalm, okay? That you cherish me constantly in your every thought. Oh God, your desires towards me are more than the grains of sand on every shore. Wow. 
that is worthy of meditating on and letting that soak in. What basically, he's saying that his thoughts of love towards you are so infinite you can't even count them because you can't count the number of grains on every shore. <laughs> I'm going to stop there. This is just really good stuff. I, 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 uh, this is something to feed on. And I wanted to take the truths that I taught on last week that you were created because God enjoys you, you were redeemed because God enjoys you, and I wanted to take it deeper tonight into something that was deeply personal, uh, how unique and special and loved you are. If, if every thought uh, uh, that God has constantly towards you is a thought of cherishing you, can you imagine if you believed that, how empowered you'd be by the love of God? And even... I gave the prophetic word right during worship in the beginning. God is saying, I give you folks permission to revel in this stuff. You can't become too self-indulgent in the love of God. You can't do it. It's impossible. If you you try to be selfish in your relationship with the love of God, he will ambush you with his love for people. And you'll end up loving people even if you don't want to because you're going to become like the one that you love. So there's no danger of being self-indulgent in immersing yourself in the love of God. And so some of you that have been at, to SOS, I use this phrase, your only task is to bask. We are, picture yourself like a walrus that wo- rolled up on the beach and you're just sunning yourself in the warmth of God's love. Yeah. Yeah. Your only task <laughs> is to bask. Okay, all right. There's, there's Psalm 139 for you. Now, um, I want to introduce Neil Frazier. Neil is one of my best friends. Um, we forged a relationship around doing off-trail hiking that we, do, that is, we call bushwhacking. We call bushwhacking. Um, and so... This guy likes to go off trail and and scrape against bushes off trail to the point that he bleeds and then he will smile. So I know that may seem a little strange to you, but he's a pioneer. He's a pioneering kind of guy that likes to go off trail naturally, but he is also a, a spiritual pioneer. And so he has pioneered a relationship with God This man's devotional relationship with God is about the best I've ever seen for any person. And when he first moved to Encinitas, or maybe soon after that, he began this habit of walking on Moonlight Beach and walking down the beach, and he often starts his walk at 4 a.m. Yeah, so this he's kind of he's a guy that likes early morning. And he's, it's not unusual for him to speak in tongues and worship God until sunrise, starting at 4 a.m. And I think that he's one of the guys, we started this a few decades ago, I think he's one of the people that actually his, his pursuit of God in his own devotional life began to change the atmosphere in the whole region of Encinitas. He was... He, he is like a present-day Enoch. See, Enoch, as Scripture says, walked with God, and God just took him. So I'm telling you, this guy, even without knowing what he was doing, just, just being hungry for God, he literally was part of the company of people that changed the atmosphere up here. And what's happening right now in the kingdom, what happened with Henry and the ones, what's happening with Jamie and the activation in love, what's happening with Mike Hubbard and, and, and all of us learning a new way to live in the kingdom, is, is, it, it, is, it is good to honor people like this that pioneered it. He's a spiritual bushwhacker and, and, and a man that has so personalized, he is now taking every psalm in the Passion Version and he is meditating on those psalms for hours and then God inspires poetry that is based on the psalm. So anyway, Neil, come up. He's going to share his testimony. We honor you in this region, Neil. We love you. Yes, Danny, no. 
You go to you go to eight forty if you need to. Okay, thank you. Uh, he had asked me also to uh, share poetry, especially based on Psalm one thirty nine that I've written. I, um, uh, I was going to do one just from Psalm one hundred four first because it, uh, it's a real tie in psalm. It also talks about creation and ver and and the third stanza of this is very uh, related to Psalm one thirty nine. This first one uh, has to do with uh, creation at, uh, of the universe and of plants and animals and of man and then uh, the ultimate creation. These are psalms based on psalms is what I sort of consider them. The universe was your blank canvas. It is your masterpiece, your poem. It expresses your love, your power, your artistry. It expresses your craftsmanship, your attention to detail. It expresses your creativity and it receives your lavish provision. No part of it escaped your notice. You spared no expense in causing it to fulfill its destiny. It displays your majesty in all of its, your vastness and wonder. It tells time in the movement of the earth, sun, moon, and stars. It provides nature what it needs for life. Nature, all plants and animals, were your blank canvas. They are your masterpiece, your poem. They express your love, your power, your artistry. They express your craftsmanship, your attention to detail. They express your creativity and they receive your lavish provision. Not one of them escaped your notice. You spared no expense in causing them to fulfill your, their destiny. They display your majesty in all your variety and simplicity. They display the full cycle of life. They provide what I need for life. I was your blank canvas. I am your masterpiece, your poem. I express your love, your power, your artistry. I express your craftsmanship, your attention to detail. I express your creativity and I receive your lavish provision. No part of me escaped your notice. You spared no expense in causing me to fulfill my destiny. I display your majesty in all your intimacy and intricacy. I display my portion of the image of God. I provide what the church needs from me for completeness. The church, your body, your bride, was your blank canvas. We are your masterpiece, your poem. We express your love, your power, your artistry. We express your craftsmanship, your attention to detail. We express your creativity and we receive your lavish provision. Not one of us escaped your notice. You spared no expense in causing us to fulfill our destiny. We display your majesty in all your glory and perfection. We display the full image of God. We provide what Jesus needs for completeness. And then three, three different psalms that I wrote based on Psalm 139. I picked three of them. You created me in the secret place. You created me in heaven. You created me in the beginning in your mind's eye. When you were first contemplating creating mankind, you created me in my mother's womb. You created me on the cross. You create me anew every morning. You create me in the secret place. You designed me for the secret place. You designed me for heaven. You designed me to breathe pneuma, Holy Spirit. You designed me to live a hidden life. Lost in the eternities of the ancient of days. Lost in the resurrected one in the eternal bridegroom. 
You design me anew every morning. You design me for the secret place. You are omniscient. You know everything. Everything about me causes you to love me more. Everything about you causes me to love you more. I'm rav you, I ravish you. You're attracted to me. I've captured your heart. You ravish me. I'm attracted to you. You've captured my heart. You are omnipresent. You are everywhere. I can't get away from you, and I never want to. You can't get away from me, and you never want to. You chase me. You catch me. You hang on to me. I chase you. I catch you. I hang on to you. And then one more out of Psalm 139. This is about the fact that uh, he's everywhere. Thank you for the deserts. Here I find you both necessary and sufficient. Here the torrential rains are coming. Here provision is faithfully brought. Here I can enter into deep solitude. Here is quality time for you and me. Thank you for the deserts. Thank you for the valleys. Here I best find you both necessary and sufficient. Here are rivers of refreshing. Here are nourishing gardens. Here is the canopy of shade. Here is quality time for you and me. Thank you for the valleys. Thank you for the mountaintops. Here I find you both necessary and sufficient. Here you are my only desire. Here you are my only need. Here I rise up to your heaven. Here is quality time for you and me. Thank you for the mountaintops. Thank you for the beaches. Here I find you both necessary and sufficient. Here is your infinite ocean of love, peace, and joy. Here in the tides, I hear your heart beat. Here I plumb your depths. Here is quality time for you and me. Thank you for the beaches. Now is this going to describe my testimony experience of walking with God? And I felt to do it in a vertical form, expressing yearning to him and expressing gratitude to him. Surrounded, uh, uh, um, enveloping the theme of, of, of my uh, journey with him. Abba. You came to me when I wasn't expecting you. You came when I knew nothing of God. I was living a life where only my mind was fed. I was in a family where I didn't experience love. I didn't know love was something to be experienced. It was outside my realm of thought. I wasn't seeking love. I wasn't looking for it. I was just living my life. But you wanted more. You wanted me. One night you came to me. You came to me in a vision. You showed me that you were the God that ruled over the universe. I saw you high and lifted up. And at the same instant, I saw you holding me and I felt you holding me. And you were saying, I want to be your closest friend. You're mine. You gave me grace. 
You gave me confidence. You gave me the gift to be able to say yes. And I said, yes, Lord, just give me, I accept what you're offering. And I was yours. You didn't show me my sin at this time in my life. You didn't ask me to repent. You just wanted me in your family. And you came. And you stayed. I got addicted to you. A few days later, the next Monday, it happened on a Friday night, and the next Monday I just, you timed it just right to where I was in an English class supposed to give to a speech to inspire. And you put it on my heart to give my testimony of what happened that weekend, and I did. And it just helps solidify in me. You gave me that grace to see it more solid in me. Make it more real. Your timing is so perfect. Jesus, you wanted that same relationship with me that I was enjoying with the Father. For the next two and a half years after that evening, you kept coming back to me over and over again. I was struggling with whether I'd done what was needed to be saved since I hadn't done the normal thing. During that time, you showed me you didn't just give me the bullet points of the four spiritual laws, although you did that. You wooed me. You drew me. You showed me how much you wanted me. How much you wanted the same intimacy I had with Abba. You wanted to have that with me. Then you thrust me into a college freshman dorm situation. And I couldn't rely on my friends around me, my Christian friends around me that I had in high school. You put me into a new situation. And that forced me to make the next step, which was just so important. One evening, Lord, you drew me I thank you for your drawing. You drew me to raw, draw out a contract with you to make it once and for all. I was tired of vacillating, wondering whether or not I was saved, whether I had a relationship with you, whether my sins were forgiven. I wrote out the fact that I had sinned and that I needed a Savior and you were the only one sufficient to be that Savior. I signed that paper and said, this is going to be the milestone that I can rely on to never doubt again. And it doesn't matter to me whether this is my salvation experience or whether it was that evening long ago, two and a half years ago. And then you, I heard your voice and you gave me a confirmation. You told me how pleased you were that I had written this out and that I was settling it not because you needed it settled, it had been settled with you from before the beginning of time, but you needed for me, for my sake, it needed to be settled. And that's what made you so happy. 
You, you confirmed that I had been yours that whole time. You and the Father are one. And you gave me a scripture that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And from that day to this, I've never once doubted my salvation. I've never once doubted whether my sins were forgiven or I was going to heaven. But there were still times that I doubted my love for you. I had love for you, I had a deep love for you and for Abba, but I also had a frail love. It was Holy Spirit's turn. He'd been working all along. He'd been preparing for a couple of years before I met Abba, even though he didn't announce himself. There were times before my experience with Abba where I would go to, even though I wasn't a Christian yet, I'd I, felt drawn to be around Christians, and I'd gone to a couple uh, home group uh, um, spirit-filled meetings that I'd walk to, because I, I, wasn't, I wasn't driving at that age. And there were times on the way home when I walked that were just so filled with joy in life. I'd walk across the football field at my old elementary school, and... Uh, I'd often run and jump and leap and dance and twirl about and just feel you. And when I got to the far side, I'd just lay down and bask. And that was before I'd met Abba. You were drawing me. You were drawing me. You were loving on me. The summer before I came to college, even before my contract writing, there was a young woman, a little older than me, that saw something in me that uh, she came to me and, and, and said, let's invite Holy Spirit into your heart. I knew her younger brother. We were the same age. And she prayed for me. And you came. At that time, I just had two syllables in tongues that I sang, that I, that I spoke. And I said those two syllables, two two-letter syllables, over and over and over again. Thousands, millions of times probably. And then six months later, you gave me two more two- or three-letter syllables. And I kept using them and using them and using them. And that went on for five long years till I had ten syllables, two or three letters each, that I just kept bombarding heaven with. I knew you enjoyed it, and I enjoyed it, and I was fed by it. By that time, you'd taken those ten syllables and you'd crafted two worship phrases out of them that you later gave me interpretation of. And to this day, I still use those phrases very, very regularly. They're so meaningful and so rich and deep, meaningful to me. At that point, there was a young believer that that just said a simple phrase. I don't remember exactly what it was, but... It unlocked the gates, and a full-blown heavenly language came to me that was separate from my worship language. It's been so nice having a, a language, Holy Spirit, that I can just enjoy communing with you with. That can express everything love talking to you in your language, your language of tongues and your language of worship. That's what I love the most, is talking in your
your language. The third part being listening to your voice. Years later, you gave me a third heavenly language, which was an intercessory tongue. And it didn't have a set vocabulary like the first worship language did, or a, it wasn't broad and general like the main language. It was described by uh, its alphabet, which was just vowels and the consonants W, H, and Y. Lord, Holy Spirit, that's the language that I go deep in with you. That's the language where I really touch your heart and I get to those groanings that are too deep for words. That's the language where you showed me had an impact in this region. In pulling down New Age strongholds, bringing the Jericho walls down around SRF. And all that was just to get to know you just to get introduced to you. What came next was a surprise to me. You started giving me some early songs and I enjoyed fellowship with you and I enjoyed communing with you in that way. It was just five, over the next decade, just a total of five songs, very few. But then I prayed a prayer Seems like I shouldn't have prayed, but it, after a couple of decades, I said, okay, I guess it was worth it up until then. It didn't seem it. I prayed, make my life so I don't just want you, but that I need you. And at the time, I felt it was going to be a decade-long prayer. I just finished a decade-long prayer of, in the 80s of... Um, of uh, saying I wanted to love with your love, with your quality and quantity of love. And I went from zero to uh, making some headway on that, and it's still, that's really the, the journey of my life, is growing in being able to accomplish that. It's something I was very unadapt at in the natural, coming from not even recognizing that there were feelings or emotions to having a um, uh, singular emotion of intimacy with you and then call, having you call me out as today to where I have relationship with others in your body. I went into a place where I went through a dark night of the soul experience. But the deep part of it that happened right after that prayer, and, and the deep part of it lasted about seven years. And during those seven years, I was in a deep hibernation, deeper than before I knew you. You took me there to a place of being asleep. Asleep in my spirit, asleep in my mind, asleep in my emotions, asleep in my will, so that you could do major surgery. I had to quit computer work, couldn't do it. I stocked shelves for 7-Up for a couple of years. I'd do that. Then I'd go home and veg and fall asleep, and that was about it. 
was dead to the world. I didn't have any interests, any anything. I was totally existing and not living. But during those years, more spiritual growth happened than all the rest of my life combined. There was a vision that that Pastor Bill gave me that um, after the fact, years after the fact, that go along with that, and I'll just briefly describe that vision that he gave me. It was a prophetic word that he spoke over me when we were on a hike. We were looking at a tree. It was a very tall tree. From uh, partway up the tree, up, it was looked totally normal, healthy. But the bottom portion of the tree um, was totally burned out. The, um, the inside of the tree was hollow. There was, uh, on the outside uh, circumference of the tree on the ground, there was three arcs. Um, it was about a 20-foot diameter tree, and there were three arcs and then three um, empty spots where you could crawl inside of it, get inside the tree. And um, Bill said that that tree represented my inner man. And you showed both of us some things about that, what that vision meant. And it talked about during this dark night of the soul, a lot of what was happening was a burning away and a preparation for being filled with him. It was an emptying and a preparation for being filled with more of the Trinity, more of the Holy Spirit. And I, when I went inside the tree and looked up, it was black, uh, it was dark, it was, and, but it, it, was, uh, it was hollow as high up as you could see. And uh, You are going to fill the emptiness with yourself. Just like in the area of love, I didn't have an old love to empty out. I had a void there and you filled it with your love. And this was just another stage of that process of you burning out and weeding out all that wasn't you in me and having room for you to come in, come inside. There are several results of this, one of which was I made a major transformation from being for example, in, in when I studied your word, I, I, I used to be before that, I would be very uh, exegetical in studying the, the scriptures. I went totally the other way into devotional studying the scriptures and devotionally uh, involved in the scriptures, like in those poems I read just at the beginning of this session. That's how I get into the scriptures now. I changed from being afraid of process to wanting more process in my life. I went from trying to cling to what I had to wanting to jettison as much as I could. wanted to eat, 
breathe you. And even from the very beginning, even though I didn't put it into practice, I wanted to pour out into others anything you poured into me. I was expecting the John 17 prayer to be answered in my life. And I do expect it. And I also want others to be able to eat of my fruit, eat of my example. It's just been the past three years, really, the, what I call the Henry Haney era. The gods really brought me out. It's really the first he's connected me with others, other than local churches I've been a part of. I've stayed in the church system, even though I sometimes have wondered why. But for the first time, I'm really feeling like it's time. Because for I was at a point where I didn't care if I was just like an Enoch, where it was just me and God and nothing else. I was fine with that. I didn't need to be understood by anybody. I didn't need to be known by anybody. But God's challenging me. And God's stirring me up. To really be a part of the body. Yeah, I just want him to read the second poem again that he read from Psalm 139. You know, and as while he's turning to that, you know, there's a preciousness to this man that, you know, I, we, we understand that he's different, but in the body of Christ, you can discover the beauty of God in somebody else. And I don't know if you caught this, but when, when he first got born again, he wasn't looking for love. He wasn't looking for friendship. And God encountered him and said, I'm the creator of the universe. I want to be your friend. And I think his born again experience was, his response was, okay. <laughs> Yeah, he actually took God up on the offer. And then only later he found out about forgiveness of sin. And God completed that. But here's a guy that was completely incapable. He never had a friend in his whole life, right? Before he got married. And then he told me I was the first friend that he had. You know, but that was what, in your 40s. So, so here's a guy that was incapable of having friendship with people. And God singled him out and said, I want to be your friend. I'm the creator of the universe. I want to be your friend. And now a guy that was handicapped in his ability to have friendship with anyone is, is got one of the closest relationships with God of anyone I've ever met. This man is a friend of God. And he's unique in the sense he almost doesn't fit. You know, I feel like he's a bit like a New Testament Protestant Christian mystic. What he's like, he, he belongs in a monastery back in the, back, you know, in a Catholic monastery back in the Middle Ages or something. But, but we have to learn to embrace different, di I mean, we have to embrace and treasure people that are different than us and express things different than us. I'm going to ask him to read the second poem from Psalm 139 again. Yep. That's my favorite. Yeah. Um, this one okay. Yeah. 
You are omniscient. You know everything. Everything about me causes you to love me more. Everything about you causes me to love you more. I ravish you. You're attracted to me. I've captured your heart. You ravish me. I'm attracted to you. You've captured my heart. You are omnipresent. You are everywhere. I can't get away from you and I never want to. You can't get away from me and you never want to. You chase me. You catch me. You hang on to me. I chase you. I catch you. I hang on to you. And that, just one thing about that psalm, what that psalm really is, is a amplification also of the idea that we love God because he first loved us. Anything that we pour out to God is only because he feels that way toward us. We can only worship and adore him because he worships and adores us. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. So, Mike Hubbard, we're going to change things up a bit tonight because the thickness of the genuineness of what was just shared, is I don't want to go on from it. Are, are, are you, do you guys feel it? There's, there's something special that I want to just linger on for a bit. And, and my, Mike, Hubbard, Mike Hubbard has agreed to give his testimony on a different night. So... Um, what I want to do is, Henry, could you come up again? Um, I want everybody to come up to the front. And we're going to try to form, what we're going to do is try to form a big circle, like a big tight circle. And uh, <laughs> let's, let's give it a try. Henry, I want some, some, some worship. And I want, Neil, I want you in the center of the circle. And I want you to just go around and just quickly touch and bless the people. Like, spread out. Let's see if we can do this. Spread out. Every, everyone come up if you can.